Hi, this is Kim with Mom's Creative Moments. Welcome back to my channel. Today is a special presentation video for you. Um, it is not a scrapbook layout like you may be expecting. That's typically what I do here on my channel. But today I wanted to share with you something special from our family since it's Easter. And this is a recipe that has been passed down from my husband's grandmother. So um, for, I think we're working on four generations now of Spillman family members that have made these potato rolls. And if you're not familiar with them, don't worry, it's, very, it's a very simple recipe. What you're going to see is a video of my sister-in-law. You'll hear my husband's voice, you'll hear my voice in the background. This is my husband's sister, Debbie, and she makes these rolls like a pro uh, for many, many large um, events. And so she is the one in the family who makes them the best and the most efficiently and has the most experience. So she's the expert and she's sharing with us her expertise. I hope you enjoy this video. I hope that you try making these rolls. They are super, super yummy. It's my gift to you to wish you a happy Easter. It's also a measure of creativity to work in the kitchen and provide something yummy for your family. So I hope that you do try this. Thanks for joining me. Enjoy the video. Okay. I'm going to be demonstrating how to make Grandma Henrietta Spillman's potato rolls. And um, a lot of thing, uh, one of the things people ask a lot about is the potato and the recipe. Um, I've done the potatoes for the recipe a lot of different ways. These were just uh, rinsed off and microwaved. You can also peel them and boil them or bake them. It's all the same. You just need a cup of mashed potatoes. So I'm just gonna peel them. Doesn't matter what kind of potatoes you use. Yeah, I've used all different kinds of potatoes. These happen to be yellow potatoes because I like yellow potatoes. I've used red potatoes, russet potatoes, doesn't matter. Just, and actually, um, if you look at the taro roll recipes, those are kind of similar. They just use taro root um, in the same way that this recipe is going to use potatoes to add um, kind of um, a moisture to the rolls and they're also a little bit of a denser roll so that is what's going on just peeling them and then honestly mashing them I have a fork here but more often than not I don't use it and then just Put it in a one cup measuring. It's not very complicated. Uh, this recipe is from my grandma Spellman. She had 16 kids. She used to come to um, visit us. I remember her. And um, she, when she came and visited, my mom said she often made these rolls and she also made apple pie. Um, but when she made these rolls, she made them really big, like the size of a hamburger bun. Um, I don't really ever make mine that big. The only time I do is if I am making them for um, pulled pork and then I'll make them big like that. She would make them without a recipe, and then one day my mom asked her to write down the recipe, and she did, and my mom has that original recipe. So this is basically a cup of mashed potato. I don't know why people have so many questions about that, but actually when I share the recipe with people, they <laughs> ask about the mashed rolls <laughs> a lot of times. They're literally just mashed up rolls. So that's the first part of the recipe. Um, next we're going to add this water. I measured three and a half cups and then put it in the microwave to heat it up. I did about two minutes 
which will make it too hot. Um, but by the time we add the other ingredients, it'll be good. We just don't want to be it to be too hot when we are um, adding the yeast. So what I like to tell people if they don't want to kill the yeast is to, um, like if you put your finger in it and you think, oh, that's a nice bath water for like kids. It's not like an adult, really hot, sear your skin off your body, but like a good temperature that you would put like a little two or three year old, that's perfect. So the water is really perfect right now. I, I don't know why, <laughs> I think it was a mistake, but the original recipe calls for one tablespoon of yeast. Somewhere along the way, I started adding two. Um, so you can make it with one or two. This happens to be two. So since the temperature is good, I'm feeling it. I'm like, well, that's good water. It's not too hot, not too cold. I'm just gonna put the yeast, sprinkle yeast on the top of the water. What if, kind of yeast is that? This is a rapid, um, I can get, I'll get the container and show it to you. Um, it's just, I think, no, it's not the rapid rise. It's just, this is active dry yeast, not the rapid rise kind. So this just happens to be Red Star. When I lived in California, I bought the big containers of it you can get from Costco, but. That's what that is, and I keep it in the fridge. And um, it calls for one cup of sugar. So I'm gonna put that in. It calls for... Why do you sprinkle it around instead of just pour it all in? I don't know, makes me happy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the sugar feeds the yeast. Yeah, the sugar... It contact with all of the Yeah, yeast. the sugger so does... sprinkle the yeast. So and the gluten and the sugar both feed the yeast. And then this is a tablespoon of salt, and I'm sprinkling it because it makes me happy. <laughs> and then in the original recipe, it calls for a cup of shortening, which totally works. Um, but I use butter. Um, a lot of times if I've forgotten to get the butter at room temperature, I just nuke it for 10 seconds, flip it, and nuke it for five, and then it seems to be good enough. But it should be like soft you know like I can not super hard yeah so now we pretty much have all the ingredients in here except for flour I'm gonna go rinse my hands so I want to talk a little bit about flour um, I've had lots of people call me after trying to make the recipe and they have different problems uh, this is my advice about flour I happen to like unbleached uh, flour. I don't buy the bread flour necessarily. I have used it, but I don't buy it on purpose. So this is unbleached flour. Um, so it's unbleached, all purpose. all purpose. And then when you're using it, a lot of times in a lot of recipes, it'll say to sift it. I don't really sift it. I just stir it up a little. You're just wanting to get the air like, I don't know if you can see this flower, it's really full of air. It's not really compacted. It's like really fluffy, full, fluffy flower. So that's what you want. And the recipe tells you to add in four of the 12 cups of flour. So you don't pack it down. Yeah, not packed at all. It's just, I'm just sliding it off the top so it's kind of flat. And then we got our four cups. And we're going to get a fork and just stir it and kind of smash in the butter and the rolls. Can you do this with a mixer? Yeah, actually, um, up at girls camp when we were making these we used the mixer um but i i never really have in the home i just always do it by hand and if i have to do a lot of batches of these rolls i just do a lot of different bowls of rolls <laughs> so 
Have you ever tried using a hand mixer? Um, no, but I, I don't think it would hurt it to do that. I, I think at this point you're just trying to mix it all up. And I think the bread machines would just, you know, you would dump in all these ingredients and then you would, you know, it would go to town mixing it with its bread hook. And then it would do all the sitting and everything in the... So this is what this looks like. So you're mashing in the butter and everything. And the rolls and everything. And can you see the top of what that looks like? Yeah, I, I zoomed in. So a potato in there. What we're going to do is we're going to actually follow the recipe. If you look, there's not a lot of bubbles on top of this. And we're going to wait and we're going to let it proof. Um, a lot of times I'll skip this phase because I think originally when the recipe was made back in my grandma's day, I think yeast was a little more fickle. I think now, as long as you have the right temperature of the water, um, I, think, I don't think it, you can wreck it. So I usually mix this and then I'll add in the balance of the flour or if I'm making multiple recipes, I'll mix this bowl and set it aside and the next bowl and the next bowl and the next bowl. And then I'll come back to the first bowl and then at that time you'll see that there's a lot of little bubbles on top of the surface of the dough and you, you know that it's working. The yeast is working, you didn't kill it, and you're good to go. So we're going to go ahead and wait until we got a lot of bubbles just to show you what it looks like. Okay, we're back now and we have our dough that's proofed. You can see that it's um, got bubbles in it and it's kind of got a rounded uh, look to it. It's definitely risen and the yeast is working and we didn't kill the yeast. So it's looking like it's ready to add the balance of the flour. So we're just going to start adding uh, what's left of our flour. Uh, the original recipe calls for 12 cups. We've already added four. So we have eight cups left. So we're just getting our flour that's got a lot of air in it, it's fluffy. We're just leveling it off on top and adding in, um, we have eight cups left. So we're gonna add in seven cups to the bowl and for that last eighth cup, we're going to set it to the side and use it to knead our dough. So one thing I wanted to talk to you about is that this is what's left of five pounds of flour. So if you're wanting to make this recipe, it takes about five pounds of flour with a little bit left over. All right, so next we're going to be kneading this in and uh, I don't like to get my hands super sticky. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, how I knead the flour into the dough and what that looks like. So a lot of times uh, I will use a dough scraper um, during this. I don't happen to have one right now, so I'm just going to show you what you would do if you didn't have a dough scraper. I'm just using a fork and uh, mixing this all in and getting it just mixed up with all the flour that's in the bowl mixed in with the dough and it's getting stiffer and stiffer as we go. If I had a dough scraper, I would mix with a fork for a while and then I would get the dough sc scraper at this point and just start scraping uh, the sides of the bowl and using it to mix with. So this is what it looks like. It's a pretty thick dough at this point. And now we're going to go ahead and get our last cup of flour, the eighth cup, we're going to spread it out and then we're going to take our mostly mixed dough and put it down on the flour and start kneading it on the table. 
Um, since I don't have a dough scraper, I'm just going to go ahead and scrape everything down in the bowl with my hand. If I had a dough scraper, I would scrape it with the dough scraper. You're going to put the dough back in this bowl. So you want the bowl to be pretty clean of the dough. And plus you can just use the rest of this dough in your recipe. So we're going to just keep scraping everything out of the bowl, adding it to our dough over here. And we're going to start kneading it and eventually it'll go back in this bowl. So one thing I want to tell you about kneading the dough is you don't want to get your hands all super sticky and covered with dough. So see how there's flour down here on this section of the dough? I'm going to take the dough that's covered in flour and press it down with my hands and then I'm going to turn the dough and I'm just going to do that over and over. I'm taking the dough that's covered in flour and pressing it down and then I'm turning the dough and I'm just going to keep doing that and adding in the little bits of dough that are have you know not all become cohesive. Add them in, turn it and Again, every time I'm grabbing sections of the dough that are covered in flour so that my hands aren't going to come away super sticky. And I'm just going to do that. The original recipe called for you to knead the dough for 10 minutes. I have kneaded the dough for 10 minutes, but I actually don't always do that. Uh, just a lot of times we'll knead it till it feels like it's pretty well mixed. If you had a bread machine or a mixer, that's what would be happening. You know, if you had it in your bread machine, it would be being kneaded by the dough hook. But I've always just done it by hand and it it's not going to hurt you to take a look at a clock and go, okay, I'm you know, been kneading for about eight minutes. That's good. The, you can't hurt it by kneading too much. So we're just gonna knead the dough. Okay, looks like our dough is looking good and we're ready to be done kneading it. Uh, I guess the best comparison I've ever heard is you want your dough to look as smooth as a baby's butt. So that's what we got here. We're just going to pick it up, put it in the bowl. I don't grease the bowl or add anything into the bowl. I just pop it right back in there. And I'm going to add some saran wrap on top of it. Some people add a, put, cover it with a cloth. I have done that. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I guess I'm just used to using the saran wrap. And I'll just put it over the top and we're going to get it covered so that it can rise. If you don't put saran wrap or a cloth over the top of it, what you wind up with is a crust on top of your dough that you're not going to want. Okay, so now that we have our dough all done, we have it covered, we just need to let it rise. And depending on the temperature of your house, it usually takes about an hour. Some people will do different things to try to help it be warm and to rise, set it in the sun, or... I think I've heard of people putting it in on their dryer. We're just going to set it on our counter and let it rise. Okay, we're back with our dough. It's uh, risen really well for us. It We actually probably left it too long and it rose a lot. Uh, this is probably more than it needed to rise. We uh, had a little lunch break in between and 
Now we have our beautiful dough that's risen perfectly and we are gonna punch it down. And some of my kids take that quite literally and have just punched it, <laughs> but it's not necessary. You're just basically collapsing it so that it can rise again. And this is really heavy dough, so you want to have all these times that it rises. So we're just gonna smash it all down. We're gonna go around the bowl, pressing it down, getting the air out so that it has a chance to rise again. And that's gonna help our doughs, um, our rolls be nice and fluffy, even though they're kind of a heavy dough. So we're gonna cover it with the saran wrap again and let it rise for probably another hour. Okay, so we're back and um, we're ready to work the dough onto the pans. So these are um, bun pans. I have three. One batch will make 45 rolls. And I have some butter for the pans and for my hands. And then this is something I purchased on Amazon because they also make me super happy. They allow you to make a lot of rolls without using up all your counter space. So you can put um, quite a few pans on here and then you don't have to have them spread out all over your kitchen. So. I like these a lot and um, I'm going to go ahead and show you working them onto the pan. So I'm going to take my first pan and just put a tiny bit of butter on it. And again, my grandma, you know, probably used shortening for all this. But we're just using butter. And then we're just gonna, uh, so I have butter on my hands just from greasing the pan. Now I have a lot more, but just gonna pinch off dough. The, I, I really have no idea why I make rolls this way, but this is how I do it. And I've actually watched um, some videos online of other people making rolls. They don't do it like this, but I make it flat. And then I pinch it all together. I decide if it's the right size. That's a roll. So that's pretty much flat. Pinch it together and try to make them as uniform as possible because you want them to cook evenly. So I just do a pattern of three, two, three, two. And after we make all of this dough into rolls. Then we're gonna let them rise and then cook them. So I would say these balls that I'm making are about the size of a racquetball. What would you think? I think those are... Yeah, about that size, a little bit smaller. So this is five, 10, and I just need 15. And as soon as my hands start to get super sticky, I'll just get a little more butter. You could also just get a little more um, flour. I do actually have some flour left over. So you can do either, both work, to just put some flour on my hands. Again, you're just flattening it pinching it, trying to get it to be, and then I, I know that they're gonna work out good. 
to just have 15 on the pan. So, so if they um, rise up and touch each other, is that okay? Yeah, sometimes I'll make them bigger. Um, I have on occasion made them a tiny bit smaller when I didn't have, um, I wanted to get more rolls out of a smaller amount. The problems that I've encountered is, so let's say I'm making, you know, 500, 250 rolls, something like that. And I just have batch after batch after batch. Then if I'm cooking them, I can only cook them one at a time. Then I have, sometimes by the time you get to those last rolls, they're like as big as your head. Because the so yeast is still... It's still rising. So it's probably better if you're... A, it's probably better if you're going to make a ton of rolls to not make 10 bowls of rolls and then have them all going at the same time. It's better to like make two batches of rolls and then, you know, then make another batch of rolls so that everything's more staggered. But I'm usually pretty... I'm usually like, no, I don't want to, you know, start over again. I just want to make them all at the same time. So, because you're saying the amount of time to cook r these rolls overall is five hours. Well, from start to finish, it takes five hours, just because around five hours. It that's not time that you're working the whole time. It's just the time that if you start, yeah. If you start the rolls five hours later, you'll have all the rolls baked. Um, and you're, the only time you're really working very hard is when you're putting in the ingredients, when you're kneading, and then when you're making the rolls. The rest of the time is just, you can go about your day and do whatever. Or sleeping, I'll do it sometimes at night where I'm sleeping. I'll get up, I'll punch down the dough. Or I'll get up in the morning and punch it down. So it seems labor intensive, but really it's more a lot of time spent waiting for them to rise and... And you cook them the same way the recipe, the original recipe says 375 for, depending on the oven, um, 13 to 15 minutes. You want them to be not overcooked on the bottom and not too brown on top. So that's pretty much it. Can you fill those? Can you put stuff in those? Uh, yeah, I haven't really ever tried to do that. I will mention I did pick out like a big plump of potato. And you probably noticed when I made the rolls that I really didn't care much about clunks of potato or clunks of butter or whatever. I just, you know, by the time you needed a bunch and punch it down and make it into rolls, there's just not... Like that's the only little bit. And actually I could have just left that in there. So again, I'm just doing, you know, three sets of five. So that's done. And these over here look like they're already starting to rise a little bit. Yeah. But uh, the other thing I would say is most of the time, when people mess up this recipe, it's because they didn't have the time to let everything rise. Because it's a heavy dough, so if you're not letting it rise as many times as it's telling you to, then you're probably going to wind up with something that tastes pretty decent while it's hot, but then by the time it's no longer hot, it's 
just a very, it's too fat and heavy and thick to really enjoy. So you just, I don't know, you just have to let things rise and be patient. Uh, one of the things I've done in the past is if I'm trying to rush um, some rolls, then I will, if I have a double oven, I will um, turn on the upper oven to as low as it'll go and I'll put the um, a pan of rolls in there and let them rise in there and then put them in the lower oven uh, to cook them. But you have to be aware that if you do that, the bottom of the rolls that are rising get a little bit cooked. So you have to just um, take that into account when you're cooking them. Maybe put them a little higher in the oven or just maybe don't cook them as long. So you said you can use this for pizza dough? No, I'm. A, you could. You could use this for pizza dough. Um, I don't because I have a pizza dough recipe. Um, you could use this for cinnamon rolls, which is the other thing that my kids make a lot of. Actually, Nathaniel, my son, came down here and was um, wanting me to make these into cinnamon rolls. And I told him, no, we were making a video. <laughs> but sometimes, like, you could do half rolls, half cinnamon rolls. And I had never actually seen anyone use... So this is a pretty classic German potato roll. It's not anything special. Um, and I was watching one of those cooking channel ones where they travel around and eat really good food at different places. And someone was using a potato roll dough and making cinnamon rolls. I was like, oh, look at that. How cool is that? So we're not the only ones doing that. So we'll see if our figuring comes out good. I think I may not have exactly 45, but we'll have close. You're pretty close. Yeah. Oh, it's actually perfect. And the reason why it came out to 45 is because I have made these rolls <laughs> so many times. Now we're gonna let them rise. How long do you let them rise? Probably about an hour. Same thing. So. So this last one, it wasn't an hour when you started doing this. No, probably because we let them rise so much before the first time. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. It's a terrible <laughs> oven. <laughs> but our rolls are pretty much ready. Um, they'll raise some more in the oven. 375 in the oven, probably about 13 to 15 minutes, depending on your oven. If you have to bake two at a time, I would put two in and then I would set your timer and I would not only switch the trays, but I'd turn the pans um, halfway through. So. That's my advice. Alright, so we have the oven set for 375 yeah. on just regular bake, no convection oven, just a cheapo oven. Yeah, super cheap. Super cheap. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst oven. And you can't even open it because we have this massive fridge in the way. So, it's in the middle. That's it. So you do one at a time. Yeah. Like if I'm in a hurry, then I'll do where you put two in and switch them and turn them. But right now, through. right now you're not going to turn them at all. You're just going to yeah, put them in. Put them in and bake it for. Yeah, I'll set this for 13 minutes. So that's it. Boom. Ta-da. So I wouldn't use, this is a cookie pan, I wouldn't use these, not because it doesn't have a lip, but because this is especially for cookies, because you don't want cookies to be super brown on the bottom. You want a cookie to be sort of cooked really evenly all throughout, and you don't want it to have a super cooked bottom. Whereas with the roll, you do 
want the roll to have this bottom. And it's even kind of good that it has a little bit of butter on the pan and it makes it good. So, yeah. That's is, is that the term of a vegan? <laughs> butter, yes. Butter makes it mo, good? Mo butter, mo butter. <laughs> <laughs> But this is, these are pretty warm, but you can see they're, you know, they're good. Steam. Oh, oh, that looks like we need to get some barbecue and put it right in there. Uh, get some butter, butter. <laughs> <laughs> or jam. <laughs> so, all right, that's it.